few weeks ago, we chatted with Dr. Joe Schwartz, previous mayor of Battle Creek, previous congressman, lifelong uh, resident of the city, and uh, also a uh, professor of public policy at the University of Michigan. We talked about a number of things, election included. Now that that's all done, we thought it might be nice to have a postscript with Dr. Schwartz, and he's joined us this morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much, and uh, great to be with you again. Thank you. Thanks for being back with us again today. Well, uh, as a public policy professor, you watch what what went on a week ago, and you say what to your students? <laughs> uh, it's been interesting because that's precisely what we've talked about uh, I'll bet. in the two class days that we've had since the election, the last being yesterday, and uh, uh, it, the outcome of the election was not what people truly expected, uh, at least most people. Mm -hmm. uh, my students, who are a very good, smart group of people majoring in public policy, and they're from all over the United States, uh, I thought had a very mature attitude toward this. Basically, okay, he's been elected president. Uh, most of us did not vote for him. But uh, that's not the job now. The job now is to make his presidency work for the United States and its mm -hmm. citizens. This is um, maybe more difficult than in years previously where one or another candidate may not have been the candidate that the one chose. But uh, you hear those uh, unifying statements made and folks go along and, and things move along. But the tenor of this election might make that difficult. We've never seen anything quite like it before. Yeah. Uh, I certainly haven't, and I've been following elections for longer than I'd like to admit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the challenge is, is uh, before us right now, and it's so difficult. I mean, he is going to be president of the United States. As a result, let's try to help his administration be successful for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some work. And uh, they had a big shuffle yesterday in their transition team, and uh, my good and longtime friend, Mike Rogers, is out. Uh, by his own wish, he's out. And uh, that bothers me a little bit because it gives me the idea that there's still a lot of storm und drang uh, in, that, uh, in that transition uh, team in, uh, in D.C. for the Trump administration. And we'll have to see what happens. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not being pejorative when I say this, but I'm, but I'm, I'm observing, for God's sake, get your act together and get this transition team going and pick the most capable people, irrespective of their political affiliation mm -hmm. and irrespective of whether they, they strongly supported uh, Donald Trump for president. Pick the best people. Well, and these signals that we're picking up from this uh, transition team situation, uh, are we jumping to a conclusion by presuming that Mike Rogers and others uh, are moving around or leaving because of some kind of real problem? One can only assume. I mean, that, that's trying to to, to penetrate uh, to penetrate the dark spaces when you try to get into uh, the meetings of something like a presidential uh, uh, transition team. But yeah. uh, I know Mike very very well. Served with him in the state senate. Served with him in Congress. Uh, known him for twenty plus years, and uh, he's a good man. Former army officer. Former FBI agent. Uh, you couldn't find anybody better to deal with national security affairs than Mike. And Mike is out along with Chris Christie, mm -hmm. and there will be others too. And a new team is, is coming in, and uh, my, I hope and pray that they are competent and that they do the right thing and that they can communicate with Donald Trump, and he understands uh, that this is no longer partisan. This is finding the best people to fill these jobs. Let, let me zoom out a second and ask this. Is it unusual for a transition team to have this kind of change? I believe it is. I believe it is. Mm -hmm. I, have not, I don't remember uh, a transition team being in place, some of them having worked with the supposition that Trump might win for months on what the transition might be, and then all of a sudden they're out the door, including the boss, Chris Christie, and, and he's being replaced with Mike Pence of Indiana, Governor Pence, with whom I also served in the House of Representatives. Uh, I, I, I believe there's instability right now in the transition team uh, and in the whole Trump organization trying to go from a, a, a candidate status into a president-elect status. And as an American, I, I hope that they're able to, to uh, fix what's wrong, get together, and do a good job in choosing 
uh, people who will basically run this country for the next four years. Yeah, and and if there's any inference you could make out of the Pence choice instead of Christie, it it might suggest, okay, if Trump needs someone with whom he sees eye to eye, Pence might be the guy. Well, that that's also true. And you remember Chris Christie was the federal prosecutor uh, that essentially sent the Trump's son-in-law's father to jail, and there has to be a little bit of, of bad blood there. Hmm. But uh, Christie's a very good politician. He's a little blustery. We know that. Right. It's a very good politician. Uh, Mike Pence is an extremely conservative, religious right uh, governor of Indiana. And, and as you know, he was a, a radio talk show host yeah. uh, down near Indianapolis prior to his, his going to the U.S. House. We'll see how it works. I just want it to work. Right. Dr. Joe Schwartz is here. We're talking post-election stuff. In fact, when we come back in a few minutes, we'll talk about this whole notion of the Electoral College and some of the backlash that's come up with that and uh, more coming up shortly on WBCK. Dr. Joe Schwartz with us this half hour on WBCK. One of the things that uh, one of the conversations that stirred up out of this uh, election result that same thing happened in uh, 2000. Some folks say, hey, this electoral college thing is a bunch of baloney. We need to get rid of it. That's, that scares me a little bit. How do you feel about that? We talked about that yesterday at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan yeah. uh, because the students very much wanted to. It's Read Article 2 of the, of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. It's very clear. It was in the original Constitution. And it was supposedly to give the very small states, the less populous states, some say in the selection of a president. Obviously, from a, a proportional standpoint, it's too much of a say uh, for the small states. And, and it, there, there have been uh, presidents who were, were essentially, for in the, from the standpoint of the, uh, elect, of the popular vote, uh, minority presidents uh, before, uh, going back to John Quincy Adams, and then you have Rutherford B. Hayes, and then you have Benjamin Harrison, hmm. and then George W. Bush, and now Donald Trump. Uh, the argument for the people who vehemently defend the Electoral College is that in a very, very close election nationally, a recount, which is what you would have almost certainly, would be a nightmare. And how would you do a recount uh, with an election as big as a U.S. presidential election? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know with all the tools we have now to count votes and what have you that, that I buy that. Uh, there will be a movement. In fact, Barbara Boxer yesterday introduced a bill in the U.S. Senate. Uh, actually, it was a constitutional amendment, which is what it has to be, uh, to, uh, to get rid of the Electoral College. But that would take a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress right. and then three-quarters of the states to ratify. And I don't, I don't see that happening. Quite frankly, uh, deep down inside, I, I do think it's time to get rid of the Electoral College because it does not serve a useful purpose now. And it gives the small states a, a much uh, a greater influence in elections uh, than they should have. Uh, if, you, if you take a state like uh, any of the, th the, th the three electoral vote states, and there are six of them, uh, any of those states, so uh, they may have, uh, you know, one three hundredth or one three hundred and tenth uh, of the population of the United States, but uh, they end up with, with 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, of the electoral clout, uh, if you if you uh, calculate what they have uh, their votes when they cast them in the electoral college, and I know that's confusing because people are confused with yeah. the electoral college. I, I presided in in the state senate when that's the electors came in and voted uh, after the uh, 2000 election. Uh, that just because they had to have somebody preside, and I was the president of the senate, and I presided, uh, I had no vote or anything. I just kind of ran the meeting when the electors. Uh, came in and, and, and voted. Uh, I believe in my heart of hearts that we should go to popular vote. Uh, I believe it's the way to go. I believe it's much more fair, and I believe we have the technology in this country, if we had to have a recount in a presidential election, to do one that's fair and square. Let's talk about why we don't do that now. We presume that there are disadvantages to popular vote. For example... Uh, just by virtue of population, wouldn't the bigger states have a bigger hand that might then help manipulate the results one way or another? I don't think manipulate is the right word. Okay. They, cert it's, they certainly would influence yeah. uh, the results more than they do with the Electoral College in the present situation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, 
it, it, it's getting to, to me in any event to seem somewhat undemocratic, small d, uh, that, uh, that we still have the Electoral College. I, I don't think in a country now with uh, essentially 325 million population uh, that uh, the Electoral College is, is a good uh, vehicle for us to use to count votes in a presidential election. I believe we should go to popular vote. Will we, do you think? No. Yeah, the votes aren't there. I don't, no, I, I don't think we will. I, I think maybe maybe in the next 25 or 30 years, possibly, because I believe there will be a movement after after each presidential election. But I uh, I, don't, I don't think we will. But I think it's this is a very good time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. it with respect to the Boxer uh, uh, proposed amendment, you know, every time over the course of my radio history that uh, constitutional amendments have been discussed, it's been illustrated and, inf and influenced and, and um, really um, focused upon the notion that constitutional amendments are not something to play with. Well, they aren't anything to play with. There's no question. And, and yeah. the Electoral College has existed literally since our Constitution was ratified in 1787. Yeah. It's been there. Look, read Article 2. Uh, but is something that w was thought to be appropriate uh, and, 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 and proper in 1787, appropriate and, and proper in 2016 in a country with 325 million people. And I, I think there's a, a discussion to be had there. Dr. Joe Schwartz is here. We'll take a short break and have a few more minutes on the other side on WBCK. A few more minutes with Dr. Joe Schwartz. So if this, um, the tenor of this election was more divisive than we've seen recently. Uh, there were a lot of um, uh, comments made by the president-elect when he was a candidate that made some people uncomfortable, made other people extremely comfortable. <laughs> um, does this worry you that the, ten the tendency for this kind of rhetoric in, in this high-level race? Yeah, it worries me a lot. It worried me during the, the, the primary process, after the conventions, and during uh, the general election. I, I, I don't think that candidates should talk the way uh, that Trump talked, and in fact, Hillary Clinton as well, mm -hmm. some of the things she said. And the fact of the matter is that uh, both parties could have chosen far better candidates uh, for the presidential candidate for this run, mm -hmm. uh, I would have gone all out to support John Kasich because uh, I, I think he would have been an, he would have been an excellent. I would have supported Jeb Bush. Uh, I would have heavily supported Lindsey Graham had he stayed in. He's a great guy. On the Democratic side, there are plenty of other people, and quite frankly, uh, it might have been better for the Democratic Party had Bernie Sanders been uh, their uh, their nominee. I served with Bernie in the U.S. House. An interesting guy, but a very very smart guy and a very patriotic guy. In a in a kind of an East Coast, born in New York, lives in Vermont way, but a great guy. Mm. And uh, so we had uh, <laughs> we had a Hobson's choice in this yeah. in this election and. Uh, it, but the election's over, and that, that, that's what I want to emphasize more than anything else. Look, the election's over. Uh, our job now is to make this administration successful, doing anything we can to steer them in the right direction and make it successful. And the thing I'm worried about most, more than anything else, because I spent half a career in, in the field, is, is national security. And, and I want him to do the, the, the right things in regard to the Department of State, the Central Intelligence Agency, all of the 17 intelligence agencies. Uh, and I want them to do the right thing. I want them to do the very best to protect this country. And I don't want to see that activity be politicized. And I'm, I'm hoping that it won't. And I'm hoping that he will choose the best people. And I am worried because Mike Rogers left yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. former chairman of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, that they haven't quite got their act together and yet that yet. But I hope they do. How do we do that? Uh, how do we put aside those of us who were not Trump supporters listening, who are worried if they're minorities or LGBT? Uh, you hear all about this a lot. Uh, how do you advise them to put all of that aside and uh, support the the president-elect support i don't say this but just stay cool and be positive uh you will be heard you will be heard and uh if there's something to to protest to be against uh, be against it in a constructive sort of a way uh do our very best and hope that they get the message that uh, the trump people get the message that we are one country we're the united states of america 
uh, and we want to do the best for our country. And if we do that, we'll get through in the next four years. Uh, I want to be more optimistic than I truly am right now. But I am as optimistic as I can be in any way that I can help. Uh, I, I will do it because I'm an American and I want the best for America. When you were here last, you said whoever gets this election is a one-termer. You still feel that way? Oh, absolutely. I feel absolutely that, that uh, Mr. Trump will be a, one, a one-term president. He won't. You don't think he'll be a star here in the next four years that will change people's minds? I want him to just hang on. I want him to exist. I want him to keep the government of the United States on an even keel. I want him to keep our relationships with other countries on an even keel. I want him to keep our military strong. And I want him to work with the Congress, and he's got a majority in both houses of the Congress, right. to, to try to enact some of the things in his domestic program, which I thought weren't too bad. Pretty good, in fact. Okay. Well, we appreciate the time, as always. Battle Creek's Dr. Joe Schwartz, public policy professor, University of Michigan. We'll stay in touch. Thanks very much. All appreciate right. it. Thank you.